Hey guys, it's Chase here, and in this video, I will be demonstrating how you can pull and save the file off of your Gemmy prototypes. This method that I will be showing you only works on EEPROMs, so if your item is from 2016 and newer, or has a square cob module, this method will not work for you. I will also be demonstrating how to run your file through Audacity to check if there's any overwritten programs on your EEPROM. Towards the end of the video, I would also like to demonstrate how you can program or burn a new file onto an EEPROM, which you can play through your EEPROM reader found on your Gemmy prototype. Every piece of equipment and software I use in this video will be linked in the description, so without further ado, let's go ahead and by locating your EEPROM. So once you've located your EEPROM, it's likely going to be wrapped up. Um, here it is right here. So we want to go ahead and take off all this tape. If yours does not have any tape, congratulations, you've skipped a step, but most of these are likely going to be wrapped up, so you want to go ahead and take it off. Um, I don't think a bunch are going to be as beautiful as this one. This is very good, healthy tape. A lot of the ones you find nowadays are pretty brittle and dry rotted, but this just happens to be all good. So it probably won't be like this, but either way, the tape has to come off whether you want to put it back on or not, but yeah. Now that we've taken the tape off the EEPROM, you're going to want to remove it from the socket. You can do this by using a flathead screwdriver. However, I recommend putting tape on the tip of your flathead so it's not to scratch the board when you try to take the EEPROM off. Um, I did forget to mention, now that we've taken the tape off, you can do whatever you want with the tape. It's up to you. You can throw it away or put it back on. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of user's choice. However, if you do decide to get rid of the tape, I would highly recommend retaping it or putting some sort of plastic bag over the reader because that tape is there to make sure that these little solder points on the back right here and on the top are not touching any other metal on here which would short it out. In my case, the EEPROM is right up against this amplifier right here and that would not be good if every single one of these pins was shorting. You definitely, I definitely want to have some sort of protection on this. I don't know if I'll put the tape back on but I do, th I do think I'll put some sort of clear plastic around this so it's not um, making contact, but it also has a fresh new protection on it. So we'll just stick our flathead underneath here, slowly prying it up. You want to be very careful doing this. You don't want to snap any of the legs in the chip. And again, carefully prying up. Very carefully. You will have to use a bit of force, so don't worry if it's not coming up, you know, instantly. You'll definitely want to use some force, but not too much force, just enough so that you're able to carefully and slowly get the chip out of the socket. Now, we've gotten one side up, other is kind of still down, but at this point we can pretty much just take our hands and kind of... There we go. So now that we've taken the EEPROM out of the socket, as you can see, none of the legs were bent in the process. If you do end up bending a leg, it's very easy to bend it back. Just be very careful, especially if you're dealing with corrosion on these things. Here is the reader. You can see it's a very healthy reader. Um, doesn't seem to be any corrosion or anything, so that's very good. Um, so we'll go ahead and put the chip into the um, programmer, and then we'll move on to the next step. Okay, now that we've taken the EEPROM out of the socket, we can go ahead and put that away because everything else will be on the computer. What we'll be using is a program called XG Pro. Um, I'm using version 12.63, and I will be leaving a link in the description where you can get this application. It's totally free, and it is 100% necessary to do this. So, as you can see, I've gotten the application. Um, this is the screen that you will see as soon as you open up the application. What we're going to do is locate the type of EEPROM this is. Now, as you can see, mine happens to be covered with tape. So I'm going to be using an example that I have right here. I have two different examples of the kinds of EEPROMs that Jemmy uses. We have an M27C 801 that is an ST and then we have another type of EEPROM that Jemmy uses and this is it'll focus an M27C4001 
It's another ST. They're not always going to be ST, but that is typically the numbers that you'll find on there. Looking back on the footage, I did want to make a few notes on the types of EPROMs you may find attached to the readers on your Jebby prototypes. I had just given two examples because those are the two I had on me currently. I have been able to burn files on those two and use them on readers. However, you may find different types of EPROMs on your prototype. So the best thing to do is just to look at the information on your EPROM exactly where I showed. The bottom of it will have all the information you need. Mine just happened to be covered up by residue over time, so I wasn't able to read it, so I used my two examples. However, most of, more often than not, you shouldn't need to uh, use an example. The information should be there bright as day. I just had a, a an EEPROM that was covered with residue, so... Just look at the information you have at the bottom of your EEPROM and type that into the application and it will work. And from there, we're going to want to enter in that information up in here. Now I have it marked as M27C801, but it won't already come like that. What you want to do is you want to click on the select IC and then you're going to type in what type of EEPROM you have. This is necessary because at first I thought that this was just a way to ensure that you're putting in the EEPROM correctly. However, it will basically refuse to pull the binary off if you don't have the correct one selected. So I will be searching up what kind this is. Now because this one is, you can't really tell which one it is, you can see that it is an ST it looks like. There we go, the lighting's better. As you can see it is an ST. But I can't really make out what numbers it is at the top of right here, so I will be using these two examples. Now, because this has two of the separated uh, little doors right there, as I call them, I'm sure there's a proper name for them that I'm not thinking of right now, I'm going to be using this one because this also has the two separated doors. So we're going to type in M27C4001. So M27C4001. Now... On the left right here, we have two different companies. We have SGS and then we have ST. Now because ours is an ST, we're going to select ST. And I usually just go with the top one up here. Usually that's the correct one. Um, again, if it gives you a warning, it says it can't detect it, then I would just move down this list. But typically it is the top one up here. So now that we've gotten our correct EEPROM selected, we can go ahead and now put this in the programmer. Now, how do we tell which way to put it in? What's Because obviously this is shorter than this. So which way do we put it in what pins and whatever? You're going to want to select the read button. Now this gives us a little schematic of how it wants to be put in. As you can see, the notch is facing away from the lever right here. So that's the way we'll put it. And it wants it directly at the top. As you can see, our notch is right here, and the notch is typically always away from the information on the bottom, so that's what we will go ahead and do. And as you can see, first leg on EEPROM is in the first pin of the programmer, so now we can go ahead and pull this down. And if all is right, we can go ahead and press read, and it will read the EEPROM. Now this is a very quick process. It's already done. So now we have our code on here. Now I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'll have to shut off the camera because I have some files on here that might pop up. But now you're going to want to press save right here. You could go to file and then save, but I have the best luck doing save right here. And then go to browse and then you can select where you want it to save to. Um, a few times it actually has worked going through file and save, but... I just tried it and it did not work for me. I had to re-record this because I could not find the file. So you want to select browse and then you want to go to this save icon right there and then go to browse and then you can put in in whatever folder you want. So now we'll go to audacity. Now I already have a file pulled up on here but to hear your file through audacity you want to go to file import raw data. As you can see up here we have the one that we've just pulled so we want to go ahead and double press on that. Now I like to have this set on 8-bit PCM 
Um, I think it usually sets you on 16, but 8-bit gives you the best quality for the EM readers. Um, and this is all default, um, one channel, that's all fine. So then we'll press import. The example that I just provided works great if your EEPROM came from an EM reader, which is what you see on the screen right now. However, if your EEPROM came from a Sonex reader, which I will provide an example of what that might look like, you're going to want to adjust your settings accordingly. Encoding at 16-bit and byte order at big. I will also provide a picture of what your new settings should look like. If your EEPROM came from the newest style of readers, which is an ESH, then the Audacity method I am showing will not work, as you will just hear static regardless of what settings you've set. And as you can see, it is very short. The reason for that is because it's very sped up. So if we go ahead and press this, you can see that it's very sped up. So we'll have to go ahead and bring the speed down. And the reason it's sped up is because if you speed up the program on the chip, you can fit more onto there. So we're gonna go to change speed and pitch. And I'm gonna lower this down to about, uh, sure, like 290, 300, and see if that is about right. That's a little bit too low. So I will do it, um, bring it up slightly. That should be enough. Perfect, and if you actually had some sort of hidden audio, it would be at the end right here. This one does not have the hidden audio. But if it did, it would show right at the end right there. So yeah guys, that's basically how you do it. Um, if you guys have any questions, let me know. I really hope this was helpful. Um, if this wasn't, if you don't really care about, you know, the end audio or whatever, any overwritten programs, I would still highly recommend buying a EEPROM programmer as opposed to just sending this to somebody or whatever. I think it's more safer to buy your own programmer and do this process as opposed to sending your EEPROMs to somebody because you got to keep in mind that these things could get lost in shipping. It could get corrupted over shipping, whatever type of um, resources they have to detect packages and do x-rays to see what kind of um, merchandise you have in the packages. So be very careful. So I did want to briefly go over how you can program or burn a file onto an EEPROM in case you wanted to put some new binary that somebody's maybe sent you or maybe you just want to put the binary that you've just extracted onto a brand new EEPROM, uh, whatever you want to do, um, this is the way to do it. So you can see I already have binary pulled up on the screen right here, but when you open up the application, it's just going to be a bunch of Fs on here. So what you'll do is you'll want to load the binary that you want to burn onto the EEPROM. You want to go to File, Load File, and then from there, it'll take you to any files that you have on your computer, and then you'll just select the, the file that I, I, that somebody sent you or that you've extracted from an EEPROM, whatever the case. And then instead of pressing the read button like you would to read an EEPROM, you'll actually want to press program this time. And again, we're seeing the same schematic on the screen, so it shows you exactly how it wants the EEPROM to be put in. Um, just, re just remember to make sure that whatever EEPROM you want to program it onto, the um, number matches, the in this case I would need to use a M27C4001. If I don't have that, then I'll want to change the EEPROM on here. And then once you have your EEPROM onto the programmer, you're going to want to press program. Now this is not as fast as it is if you were to just pull the binary off of an EEPROM. Pulling the binary off of an EEPROM takes it like 30 seconds at max, if that. Um, whereas programming it can take up to five minutes. So it's not very fast. And it does depend on what EEPROM you have. I have heard and I have experienced myself that some EEPROMs are faster to program than others. Um, so just be aware of that. And it does not matter whether you are putting the binary on an EEPROM that's going to an EM reader, or if it's going to a Sonex, it's gonna be, or, or a, um, an ESH, it's gonna be the same process as far as doing it on the programmer right here. And if you don't wanna keep buying EEPROMs to program 
if you just want to have like one or two lying around that you want to program, I do suggest investing in an EEPROM eraser. This was like, I don't know, like 30 bucks on Amazon. It's very cheaply made, but it does work. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Really hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you guys again next time.